about an introduction to that. An introduction to dynamic linear models. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Professor Edbeke Lopez, who, uh, besides being a close and great friend of mine, uh, is well known for the difference that he has uh, been making to base and inference. And uh, he, he's currently a professor of statistics and econometrics at Innsbruck. And uh, he runs the research group of statistics, data science, and decision. Between 2021 and 2023, he was uh, head of statistics at the Mathematical and Statistical Science of the State University. And uh, uh, before uh, joining, he was professor of economics at the University. Of he has been making uh, very important contributions to the area of dynamic linear models. Two that he will be enjoy uh, today. His fellow uh, the International Society for Bayesian Analysis and he co-authored uh, the book uh, MCMC Stochastic Simulation for Bayesian Inference with Danny Gammerman. So Edbert, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much once again for being with us today. Okay, thank you Alex for such a nice introduction. It's, uh, it's actually pretty nice you to be able to to talk to, to people from all over the, the planet. I see here people saying that they are from Brazil, some other people from some African countries, some in Asia, Europe. Um, I, are you guys, I mean, I'm gonna use some of you to ask if you guys are, you can hear what I'm saying because when you talk in yes, these kind of seminars, sometimes you are talking for, him, for yourself like for five minutes and then you realize that the internet has gone off. Uh, I mean, a hotel, I, apparently the internet is fine here, but uh, if something happens, I, I guess the idea is to try to reconnect, right? So right now we have uh, uh, 72 people in the room. And um, when uh, Alex asked me to, to, to talk about dynamic models, I basically went through the slides and stuff that I've done in the past. So in a way, my sound like you will see notations, they are a little bit different here and there, but uh, hopefully that will be compensated by the, so the level of, the basic level of the examples and illustration and the code that I provide uh, with my, my examples. So you can go and rerun uh, some of these um, analysis. So, because we only have one hour and a half and as we keep talking and hopefully you guys are gonna ask questions. So please do ask questions because we can compile them and, and see if we can go back and try to answer some of them. Okay. So I'm gonna go and share my screen and, uh, and see if we are able to, let me see, go back here to the beginning. So this, this first set of slides, as you can see in the way that I, I outlined it. I'm gonna minimize the the screen here on the corner so I can I see my own slides, and let me know if when I do that we'll go on the full screen. So why it's not going to the full screen now? View full screen mode. Is it full screen for you guys as well? Yes. I mean, of course, it's not full because it is Zoom full. Has, like, takes part of your your screen there, but uh, um, in this first, I would say in the first half hour or third of this uh, webinar, uh, what I'm gonna do is, you know, briefly review um, dynamic models, but in the class of linear models. So that for those who are familiar with regression models, think of a linear regression where the coefficients of the regression vary over time. So I will talk about this here in a more general setup, and then I'll show an example of a linear regression, an actual linear regression with dynamic um, coefficients. Depending on the area where you work, uh, some people call those time-varying parameter models. That's particularly the case for econometrics, macroeconometrics. So whenever you see people talking about uh, time varying parameters, what they are basically doing is they are fitting regressions where the coefficients follow state space models, dynamic linear models, the way that I, I will you know, introduce here. So let's go to the, so let's go straight to the, the simplest of the cases. And 
the most generic setup. Uh, what makes a state space model, or as I will say here from now on, a dynamic model, that's like a, a terminology that we prefer. It kind of uh, links back to the work of Weston Harrison, Weston Harrison and Migon, and the research that Alex did throughout her career, and I did myself, Marco Antonio Ferreira, and a bunch of other Bayesians from Brazil follow that, uh, that path. And the idea is when you look at this, you guys can see my, the little hand here, right? I'm gonna use that as a kind of a mouse a pointer. Um, essentially in a dynamic model, we don't, we don't model directly the dependence of what we observe because the belief is that the, what you observe is filled with noise. It's a, it's a measurement error type of behavior. So if you think about why being you know, like the level of the ocean or why being the inflation of a particular country, we don't observe those quantities exactly. We'll, we go and measure with instruments, collecting a basket of products. And then in the end, we construct this index, this Y. Uh, but the hope is that the Y is, is done or is collected in such a nice way that it does relate to the underlying hidden uh, process, which is this XT. And that's where the idea of the dynamic model comes uh, comes from. The Xs are not observed, but they are temporally dependent, as you can see with those errors. XT plus one depends on XT, and XT depends on XT minus one, but they also influence the behavior of YT minus one directly. XT uh, affects YT, and XT plus one affects YT plus one. And most of our effort in dealing with these kinds of models uh, will boils down will boil down to the situation where once you observe the the observations here, the whys, how you can infer this hidden process. So the idea is that if you are able to 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 talk about the hidden process probabilistically speaking, then you can you know try to uncover the dynamics behind this proxy. The, the wise. So this generic setup basically tells me that for any given observation or vector or matrix of observation yt, that depends on xt. But xt depends on xt minus one and xt influences xt plus one. At the end of the day, we have this upside down t shape dependence. So once you observe those four nodes, xt plus one, xt, xt minus one, and yt, we get all the information we need, and then we don't need the other previous Ys, the future Ys, the future Xs, and the previous Xs. That creates what we call a local, um, a local dependence structure. And with that local dependence structure, you know, we take advantage of that when it comes to estimation, as I will, I'll show you in a minute. So let's uh, use some notation. Um, uh, basic notation relating uh, the y and x now like with uh, names and families and things like that so going back to the previous slide we're basically saying y depends on x and x depending on previous x how what is the simplest model where that that happens the simplest model is this first order dlm or local level model or you know like a random walk uh, dynamic model and the idea here is that yt or yt minus plus one, depending on the the preference of the of the author, the book that you you open. The point is, you are relating the yt plus one as a function of xt plus one directly. So yt plus one is xt plus one plus some noise, and that's sigma square. And uh, the system in the system equation, xt plus one depends on xt, also directly linearly plus some other noise. So the, the, the main task for uh, infer inference is to not only learn you know, how the things relate, but also to learn these two variances. And the more you know about sigma square and tau square, the better will be your, your understanding of the relationship between y and x. Of course, if you go back to a situation where tau square is zero, 
we're basically saying is that all the x's are the same and equal to x zero. And in that case, we are basically saying that the y's are all you know, normal Gaussian with a particular mean, let's say x zero and variance sigma square. And the posterior inference for that kind of static model is straightforward. Um, the, the nice things that start to happen when, you know, that tau square is not zero, but it's also not too big or then in, on the other extreme, not too small relative to sigma. So the ratio between sigma and tau is what we call the signal to noise ratio. So this signal is the structure of the axis. The noise essentially is what is, you know, added to the X to produce the Y. So the sigma square, if sigma square is much bigger than tau square, we have we have some signal, but the noise is so big that you're not going to be able to recover the, the signal by only observing the Y. So ideally, we want tau square to be much smaller than uh, tau square to be much bigger than sigma square, and of course in that case. In the opposite case, if sigma square is equal to zero, then what you has what you have is that all the y's are the axes, so you don't have unobserved components. All the y's are the actual observations uh, x, and the x would evolve as a random walk or more general, uh, you know, first order uh, dependence models. One of, one of the things that you know, you can start doing, but in order to motivate um, state space models is that if you go back to that slide, that one, and if you look at the dependence of Y given X, the joint distribution of the Y's is basically the joint distribution of the Y's given the axis. So Y T minus one given X T minus one is, is normal. Y T given X T is also normal and Y T plus one given X C plus one is also Gaussian. So you can actually say that all the vector, all the components of the vector Y conditional on all components of this latent vector X is Gaussian centered around X. And because the X depends on X C minus one, we can construct the joint distribution of all the X's. So think about N, think about N here being 5,000 uh, daily observed temperatures. So what we're basically saying is that the temperatures for these 5,000 data points depend on the latent process, which is also 5,000 dimension. And that is, you know, centered around X zero or zero if you want, if you don't have that X zero, let's say, just to simplify. The complication comes from the fact that now when I do that in this vectorization uh, framework, that sigma, that omega matrix is going to be 5,000 by 5,000. And of course, at some point when we do Bayesian inference, we need to invert that matrix. So rethinking a state space model or going back to the static version of the state space, state space model would imply you know, inverting a matrix of the order of the observations. And these days we run state space models of with you know, tens of thousands of observations. So if you have like 20,000 observations, daily data or intraday data in uh, financial uh, econometrics, we have data that is observed at every single minute of the day, seven days a week, you know, 365 days a year. So if you have 20 years worth of days, then you see that you have like probably millions of observations. So you cannot estimate covariance matrix that is a hundred a million by a million um, easily okay. as i say here if i think about the posterior distribution of the state given the the y's and this additional parameters there is this covariance matrix that has an inversion of a you know in this case let's say n by n matrix so uh, mathematically it's beautiful we could have done with this with this particularly simple uh, state space model, we written as a static, you know, Bayesian update of, you know, multivariate normals with multivariate priors, which are also Gaussian. But that's not the, the, the attractiveness. Uh, the Kalman filter, you know, these guys, the Kalman and other researchers, 
engineers, physicists, you know, back like 60, 70 years ago, they realized that they can actually think about the joint distribution of the states, which is that distribution, this one here, or, sorry, this one, that joint distribution, not, not exactly by inverting a n by n matrix, but by working out the joint distribution of each one of the states conditional on all the other states into the future and taking advantage of this Markovian property. So if you do want to think about X given Y, the whole vector, you could think about X1 given Y and then X2 given Y and given X3 and all the others. And you can do that all the way to N. So you replace inverting an N by N matrix by you know, thinking about densities, which are all in this particular example, all scalar, you know, and scalar. So it, it breaks completely the dimensionality uh, curse that uh, affects the multivariate uh, distributions. So, uh, so that's the idea. That's the main idea of the common filter and the common uh, smoother. And here's a, uh, Here's one slide that summarizes what I what I just said. What the common filter recursions or the Bayesian update for state space models in the simplest case will do is at any given time we are here on the left uh, part of this sequence. You know, you have like a particular state. Think about let's let's take the example of uh, uh, the the surface of the ocean at a particular latitude and longitude at time t, given the data of all the temperatures you collected, for instance, at that particular point uh, as proxies. <clears throat> when you're sitting at time t, you get the Poisson distribution of xt. And then one thing you do is you, you want to go all the way to the right, which is the Poisson distribution of xt plus 1 given yt plus 1. So when you, if you find a way to complete that cycle, then you just discover an algorithm that goes from t equals 1 to t equals n, or capital T. Uh, and the steps between, you know, these moves are very natural because you go from a Poisson distribution of xt to something that we Bayesians are very comfortable with, which is a prior. If I think about a variable, a parameter, or anything at, at time t plus 1, but I only have data up to time t, well, that's a prior because we are thinking about, you know, the uncertainty about a particular proposition conditioning on existing data. What we actually want to do is to get the, the possible distribution of that quantity given the data up to that point. So we are back into you know, the posterior um, setup. So this move from the first point to the second in the error in this sequence here is just creating a prior. But as, as we do in Bayesian statistics in general, once you give me the prior, I go back, mix that prior with the likelihood. So prior times likelihood is proportional to the Poisson distribution. So, and because we're talking about state space models, time series models, we usually call this first step an evolution. So we are evolving into the future. We're just opening the window and seeing what's going on out there or projecting what might be going on out there based on data from up to, you know, yesterday. So today, this morning, we open the window and say, well, yesterday it rained, so it might rain today. Then you you observe that, well, on an, any given day, how you get this kind of information, and then you update given whatever information you obtain today to you know, get your information for the next cycle. And you keep going through uh, that, uh, <clears throat> you're going through that cycle. So because we have, I'm going back a couple of slides, we are in that very simple first order DLM. We know this distribution, Gaussian and Gaussian. And right now I'm fixing sigma square and tau square. Later on, we're going to learn about them as well. So we are sitting here at time t with a posterior distribution of a, part, of a state, which is Gaussian with a mean and variance that is, let's say for now, given. What we do is we propagate into the future. So we evolve and we evolve according to the law which is the evolution equation, the system equation of the state space model. When we do that, we're basically, in this simple example, we're basically inflating the variance of this posterior yesterday. So 
just going from the posterior yesterday to the prior today, you just take the variance and inflate by tau square, which is the, the variance that comes from the evolution equation, from the system equation. And as I said, if that tau square is very small, we don't do anything. You just, you know, update just the same distribution. So that is how you inflate in the prior. So combining that prior with the likelihood, which is a normal centered around xc plus one with a variance of sigma square, we are able to get, you know, get ahead and talk about this predictive distribution. Is, in other words, I might have assessment of the latent variable at time t plus one, but at the end of the day, I want to forecast, for instance, inflation at time t plus one, not the latent process that observed inflation follows. I actually want to, to learn about the observed inflation for tomorrow so I can make policy and other things. Again, because my example here is very simple, as I do that, the only thing I do is increase even further that initial variance, CT, initially increased by tau square and now increased by sigma square. So when you do all that, you get like this marginal likelihood. And as a product of the Gaussian uh, normal distribution properties, we, it's relatively simple and easy to show that the Poisson distribution at time t plus one is also Gaussian and you update based on your the error of your forecast. In other words, common filters, common recursions were initially very popular among, among uh, you know, targeting tracking. Think about the ship moving on the ocean. So you have like the ship starts moving and you realize it's moving way north than you wanted and then you correct that. So it goes back to the, the path that was originally proposed. So this is what we're doing here. So the distribution or the state, the ne next position of the ship depends on where the ship or the locations that you observed at that particular point. So you keep readjusting your state equation. And that's one part of the, the whole um, estimation procedure because particularly for those working with modeling, if you wanna model a data set um, of time series, Another thing you want to ask is what is the distribution of the states condition on the whole data set, not a sequential, you know, as you observe data, you go and update. It's pretty common to think about uh, economic examples because if you're thinking about how you're going to predict either the weather or you're going to predict the return of a particular asset tomorrow, you don't have information from the day after tomorrow. Otherwise, you would have used that to, to buy or sell uh, securities. When you do this sequential learning, you're actually trying to you know, increase the power of prediction, learning about the future conditioning on the past. But at the end of the day, once you have the whole data at hand, one question that usually modelers have is that, what kind of behavior my data uh, had over time and how that affects the estimation of the hidden process that drove the data through time. So that idea is what we call fitting or smoothing through the data. It's not like the main goal is not anymore to forecast. The main goal is to see if there is pattern that is cleaner than the actual observed data. So you can make, you know, uh, make assessments about seasonality, about uh, structural breaks, uh, regime shifting and other types of uh, uh, anomalies or patterns that the hidden processes <coughs> Uh, we'll have. Um, let me let me let me see if you guys are still with me going through an example. In this example, I actually simulate data. The data is the are the black dots, and the hidden process xt are the uh, the red ones. Of course, the way that I have here, the red one is inside the black ones because in the, the simplest state space model, what I'm actually doing is simulating the, the X plus some noise, I get the Ys. And as you, you see here on the corner, what I'm basically saying is that sigma square is one, which means sigma is one, and tau square is 0.5, which means that tau is you know roughly 0.7. So there is like a signal to noise rate, ratio of uh, you know, 0.7. 
So it's those errors are very similar. So you see that there is like variability in both time series. The only one that, you know, in a real life setup, you're going to observe is the black one. But right now I have the red and the black one so we can see how they behave. And here's how, once you get only the black ones, here's how the common filter works. You see that at any given moment, what I have here are the 95% credible intervals for the forecast or for the fit posterior distribution of the state at time t, given the data up to time t in the common recursions. Uh, and the blue dots are the actual, uh, the actual, in this case, the actual axis. We're never gonna have those in real life. We never, we never have, you know, a real like you know simulated <clears throat> or real model structure. We we use modeling to 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 try to understand nuances of the data. But as you can see, this is like going forward. But what if once I get to time hundred, I go back and say, well, now that I already have one hundred observations, what is the probability or what's the distribution of x? 40 given data up to 100. So I go back here to 40 and say, how do I reevaluate that black vertical line at the light of 100 observations? And that's what the next slide is. So here's the common smoother. So we go all the way to the end and then you, we go backward reevaluating re and making sure that all the data is helping to predict any given point in time. So if I keep going back and forth between these two slides, you can see that the smooth one is more smooth, of course, but the intervals are also smaller. Smaller, you see like bigger, smaller. The main message is that because now we are using 100 data points, we you know, learn better the structure. Of course, here at the very end, the forward or the backwards, they, they look very similar because in all these cases, you have like more than 95 observations. So little changes are gonna happen here. But if you go back to the beginning, you know, as data show up, you know, there's all these abrupt changes. When you do the smoothing, you see here like, you know, you see that the process is like going up and down a lot in the first few observations, but in the smoothing one, it's always like going up because I'm already looking into the future in order to learn about the, the state. So let's see if there is any, any question here. So final questions. So final question, okay, great. So I'm gonna continue then here with, uh, with another aspect of, of a state space models where you have Gaussianity and linearity, which is these days more, it's becoming more rare because people are going nuts with all the non-linearities, non-Gaussianities to try to accommodate more realistic data. Nonetheless, if we do consider Gaussian and linear state space models, one thing that people do, which is actually very clever, it's not necessarily a Bayesian, uh, a Bayesian strategy, but it is in sense a Bayesian strategy, which is integrating out all, that, all those states and uh, even if you open uh, textbooks like uh, the structural time series uh, uh, book of uh, Andrew Harvey, you're gonna see that they do that because they talk about the likelihood of, of the observed data, which is this one here, without the states. The only difference between what they do and what we do is that we incorporate some prior for the, you know, in this case, the two variances, <clears throat> but that, that P of Y and given theta is the joint distribution of observables given static parameters. There is no, the axis, they disappeared here. But I go back a few slides like these ones. As we go forward in the common filter, we collect this marginal likelihood that, that has no X in it. We have X here in the posterior, we have X in the prior, we have X in the posterior, but we don't have X in the, the marginal likelihood. Well, this is the distribution of YT plus one given Y superscript T, which are all the Ys up to time T. And if I keep aggregating this information, I'm actually getting as a 
byproduct this one distribution, which means that I can evaluate point-wise for any value of theta, sigma square and tau square. I can evaluate this function integrating out the axis. So there is like a, a n-dimensional integral that is you know easy to do when you have Gaussianity and you have linearity for your state space model. Even if you have multivariate matrix variate, you can still do it. The main, the main two properties are Gaussianity for the equations and linearities for the equations as well. So here's an example for from the previous um, from the previous simulation of how the distribution, the Poisson distribution of uh, sigma square and tau square would look like, which is basically the product of a prior and that density here, which is a non-linear function of now sigma square and tau square. Edwin. Yes. There is a question in the chat. Can I use 20 data points for smoothing instead of 100 data points? Yes. Um, depend, depends on what you want, because if you think about, uh, let me go back to that picture when we do the smoothing here. Any, any of these points now, the black ones, are the distribution of a particular x, the state variable, given the information from time one to time 100. Uh, one thing you could do is what we call look ahead, a look ahead strategy. If, even if I'm looking into the future here uh, in the forward scheme, one, people, one person could just say, okay, how about if I just collect the next 20 observations and do locally the smoothing? You could do that. It depends on how strong is is the dependence of the states on its past um, for you to cut in that window of 20. If your state, if the evolution of your state equation is very fast, probably you don't have, you don't need a hundred observations. The distribution in this case here, the distribution, let's say of Y 40 given Y, the X 40 given Y 100, will be virtually the same as the distribution of y x 40 given y 50, 10 more observations. So you can plot that and you'll see that it's virtually the same. In many cases, the structure that, that, that show the evolution of the state has what we call long memory. This will be particularly uh, obvious when we talk about stochastic volatility uh, in a bit. Uh, in that case, uh, a, a error in the evolution equation today is going to have an impact over the next 20, 50, 100 observations. So if you're thinking about smoothing, then you need those 100 observations until that impact fades away to zero. So I hope that helps to, to explain that. In fact, you're right. You don't, if you are optimizing, you have like a very small computer or you have a very big problem and you want to do like smoothing, but you don't want to do the smoothing with all the data, we have to learn about how many, what is the, how big a window into the future you need to go in order to, when you smooth back to smooth properly. Uh, for this example here, probably not even 10, like five or six will be enough to get the same kind of results. But that's a good point. And eventually I'll, I'll add a slide like this to, to, to this in the future. Okay, so, now we, we are getting to that point where we talk about state space models and say, okay, so how can we embed now this into a more complicated situation? Because in the previous slide, I was talking about one way to think about sigma square and tau square is to integrate out, um, is to integrate out the, the axis. That makes this function here very nonlinear on sigma square and tau square. But if you go back to the state space equation, sigma square is a variance of a linear model. Tau square is a variance of another linear model, like an autoregressive model for the axis. And in principle, it would be easy to think about this full conditional distributions for sigma square and tau square. But that is only the case when I get back and include my axis. So the idea of learning about the state, the static variables condition on the axis is very appealing but you need to learn the axis. So if you think about the thetas, condition on the axis, and now you think about the axis, condition on the theta, which is the common filter we just talked about. Now you have the whole setup 
with the ingredients necessary to do like an MCMC scheme for this example. And the idea of that scheme is what we call forward filtering simply because down here, we are doing forward filtering, the common filtering. We go back with the common smoother, sample from that common smoother. That's why we get a, a draw. And then we plug in that draw here and then we sample theta from a particular posterior distribution. And, uh, and when we do that, we those uh, the clown of points here is basically doing the MCMC for that example, while the exact uh, calculation derived from this picture, which is evaluating this function in a grid for theta for for theta for sigma square and tau, which is exact because there is no no Monte Carlo error here. It's like an exact calculation of a number. Um, and you see that the MCMC works beautifully and the, the MCMC draws, which are the histograms, are very close to the actual densities that you obtain analytically by implementing uh, uh, the, the integration of the axis. So that's the idea. And here you sh I'm showing you, it's, this picture is kind of funny because it, it looks like you're kind of dizzy or blind but it essentially shows the posterior distribution of the states given the whole data, but without any um, specific value for sigma square or tau square. And then the next one, I plug in sigma square and tau square, going back a few slides at that little point there, the dot point. So I get that point, sorry, not that one, here in the center of the distribution. And then I plug that point 87.63, and you see that they are very similar. Again, it's a simple example, but these two distributions, it, it should be emphasized that these two distributions are not the same. In the left one, it's like a more cumbersome to get because you're integrating out sigma and tau square from the posterior distribution of sigma and tau square, sigma square and tau square. While on the right, we're actually doing the smooth distribution of the axis but conditioning on specific value of sigma square and tau square. So all the uncertainty over time or into the future about sigma square and tau square is ignored in this you know, red, the red curves here. So what is the lesson from this first order DLM? Uh, in general, here are the structural um, it, steps, so the two steps when you go from a posterior time, posterior time T, which is this uh, integrand here, you actually take that distribution, combine with the evolution, and you integrate out xt. So you're basically getting rid of xt and concentrating on xt plus one. So you need that integral. When you have Gaussianity linearity, that is an easy integral. And once you get that integral, which you call here p of xt plus one given yt, you plug that in here, combine with the with the, with the likelihood, likelihood and prior, posterior. Likelihood is Gaussian and linear. Prior is Gaussian and linear. Posterior is Gaussian and linear. So these two difficult problems when you have linearity and Gaussianity, they disappear very quickly when you uh, tackle more uh, real state space models uh, applications. So over here, when I say over the last 20 years, now it have to be updated. Over the last 30 something years, ever since the, the revolution of MCMC schemes in all areas of, of statistics or Bayesian statistics, particularly for those working with time theories and state space models, um, you know, here are a few references of 20 something years ago of how you were able to come back to this. Uh, being able to obtain the distributions on the left, even when the, the distributions here on the right are not necessarily Gaussian and not necessarily linear in the relationship between y and x, and also between x and x minus one. Um, and of course, there is like a, a huge number of uh, methodologies, computational algorithms, applications in various areas, and for each one of them, uh, the MCMC scheme or even the sequential Monte Carlo scheme or whatever other scheme, including not necessarily Monte Carlo ones, try to approximate these two 
difficult tasks, integrating here and updating according to Bayes theorem. So um, let me control the time a little bit here. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna go through the next five or 10 slides very quickly, just to show that everything I described in a very simple setup where yt was a function of xt. And now I, the first uh, apology is to is now that I put this in a regression setup and so the xt became beta t. So think about this as a regression where yt is a response variable and the vector ft contains the regressors. And now what I'm saying is that you have a regression with time varying parameters beta t. So this setup here is what we usually use for <clears throat> uh, general dynamic linear models, more specifically general normal, di normal dynamic linear models. So you have a relationship between observations and regressors through you know, parameters that vary over time. And then you, you plug down here some evolution structure. So that G matrix tells how the components of beta evolve over time depending on the components of beta yesterday. It might be that one of some of the betas, some of the components of the beta depends on various betas yesterday, others depend on only itself yesterday. And, and so all, all sorts of dynamics can be incorporated in this matrix GT uh, that creates like compartmentalized components. So that could be like very large in dimension to accommodate, you know, cycles, seasonalities, all sorts of switching structures for the for these coefficients. So some people might want to call this, a, uh, as I said, a normal dynamic linear model. Right here for, for us, it's probably easy just to call this a, a dynamic regression model. If you do have a dynamic regression model, which is both linear, as you see, yt is linear in beta t, and beta t is linear in beta t plus one. So the linearity is guaranteed. And if the errors are both Gaussian conditional knowing V and W, we're back into the Gaussian linear case. And then in that Gaussian linear case, we can, <clears throat> here are a couple of examples, we can do everything in, in uh, we can do everything in closed form. Posterior time t, t minus one, prior time t, you see Gaussian, we just changed the mean and the variance of the Gaussian. Predictive at time t, which is yt given yt minus one. Gaussian as well with mean and variance that are easily computed. And finally, posterior distribution of yt given the beta t, the coefficients or the latent process given yt. Also Gaussian with mean and variance that are easily computed recursively. So that's the common filter in this more general uh, dynamic regression setup. And as I said, you go backwards the same way we did before, now with a little bit more of notation. And then you can show now like lots of matrices here, depending on the structure of your state space model. But apart from these ugly equations, this is all easily computed. They all like recursively computed. <clears throat> the same thing for smoothing. So the idea of now like putting in uh, words, the algorithms that we mentioned before, uh, we can sample the beta T according to this common filter, which is uh, a combination of the common filter and the common smoother, which became like almost 30 years now to be known as the FFBS. You know, if you talk about FFBS, everyone will say, oh yeah, I know, like is the Bayesian update of the states in a non-Gaussian, non-linear state space model or Oh, sorry, Gaussian linear, but conditionally Gaussian, conditionally linear state space model. And uh, all the derivations are here for you if you want to look at. They also show up in my, in my, in the book that I, I wrote with Danny Gamerman. So I'm going to skip through that, those slides. I'm just going to go through that tiny little example to finish this, uh, you know, let's say half, you know, half of the webinar. And uh, just to show you what's happening here. So uh, in this case, I have, I'm back into the local, uh, local linear first order DLM. Yt is a function of beta t. If you wanna change that beta t to xt, we'll go back to the slide number one. <clears throat> and what I'm doing here is that I'm basically saying yt is beta t plus some noise, which has standard deviation equals to one. 
and beta t is floating around beta t minus one with a standard deviation or variance of size 0.01, which means standard deviation of 0.1, or 0.5, which is means a standard deviation of 0.7. So either the standard deviation is 0.1, very small, or 0.7, very close to the variance or standard deviation of the of the observation equation. So in that in those two scenarios, we add two more scenarios where we only have 100 observations or we have uh, 10,000 observations. So uh, sorry, 1,000 observations. And we replicate, uh, well, not me, but the paper that's listed down here, uh, replicate this exercise 100 times. And uh, for each one of those, we do base and inference based on the FFBS or some other scheme based on 20,000 um, MCMC draws. And the idea is that when we do MCMC, we need to, we need to account for the dependence of the Markov chain of the MCMC scheme. So it computes uh, effective sample sizes. So it, in fact, we, we take into account the, the serial autocorrelation of the Markov chains created by the MCMC scheme. And uh, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, I just wanna illustrate comparing scheme one and two to show you one of the main problems, and that will that will appear again in the stochastic volatility example that I'll show at the very end of this webinar, which is should I sample each one of the betas of every time from one to n separately plus v and w, or should I try to sample all these betas together? So in the top scheme, scheme one, I have n plus two steps in your Gibbs sampler. And then in scheme two, I have only three steps, sample beta given V and W, sample V given beta and W, and then sample W given beta and V. So here's um, here's the uh, how much more time we spend in scheme two, sorry, in scheme two relative to scheme one. So it's almost twice as slow. So Definitely, if you are if you only care about computational time, go with one. So it's much faster than two. Because remember, what is what is two doing? Two is doing the FFBS. So you run all the way to the end, then you go backwards. So you do twice this this sweep of the observations. In the scheme one, you only do a one sweep. You sample each one of the betas. So it's definitely twice as fast as the scheme two. But here's the, the catch. If you compare, <coughs> sorry, scheme one here, columns one and two, forget about three, okay? If you compare scheme one and, th and two as the effective sample size that you are you know, simulating your MCMC, even though scheme one is much faster, when it, when it comes down to effective sample size, it's always much smaller than effective sample size of scheme two. And it's not only twice smaller, because if it was only twice smaller, then it would compensate to run the other twice as fast. But in this case, for instance, it's like 10 times, you know, 100 times smaller. So it's, a, it's definitely much better to sample the betas jointly. And that's one of the things, because for those of you who have done MCMC for non-state space models, one thing that we learn is that if the if the vet, vector of parameter we're trying to do an MCMC scheme is highly dependent, most likely the MCs, MC scheme will be very inefficient. So you try to reparameterize, orthogonalize, uh, do blocking. This is what this was uh, the nightmare of Bayesian statisticians over the last thirty years, trying to find faster and more efficient ways to sample from the Poisson distribution. But the thing is, when you step into state space models, dynamic models, and naturally, the states are highly dependent because if they were very independent, there is no state space model. So the very fact, the DNA of a state space model instantly make MCMC schemes very inefficient. So most of the time, we, there were, we who work with a spatial temporal um, you know, state space models, we're always trying to you know, sample in, in general here from 
something similar to scheme two, where you try to sample all the betas jointly. So that's the main message from uh, this, uh, this um, example. Um, there are other extensions. I think I'm gonna stop from this uh, set of slides. Um, now that I have like 75 people here, I'm just gonna go and show quickly where you can find these slides, but later on, someone can tell you that. You can go, it's very easy. You can just go to my page. Oh, what is your page? Just my first name, hedberg.org. That will show like a bunch of things going on here. So you go to my teaching, and there are, you can, you know, go and, you know, check out what I have in the current teaching. But most of the time, you might want to go here to short courses that I've, you know, tutorials, webinars now and other things over the last, I don't know, 20 years. And uh, the one that I'm working on right now is just like a combination of notes that I have from other places. So you just go to this one and then you can either copy these PDFs or the HTML. So I'm going to go to this normal linear normal dynamic linear model to show you like quickly because I have everything here that you can you can uh, replicate I'm gonna make this a make this a little bit bigger you can see what I what I have here right it's am I talking to myself yes no 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 we are All right. here. And actually, so, I, have, I have a question for you, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through these slides because it's basically the same thing I had before. You know, I, I give this all the things here, but the, the beauty, which I think would be beautiful for those who are not too familiar with this notation, is that I mix all these, you know, the derivations and I have here the R code for that. So you can actually learn and run this code and see what's happening uh, throughout the the. The, the analysis and say, oh, but I, do I have to copy and paste the pieces of the <clears throat> of your R code? No, you can just go here to the top right and you can download the R markdown and then you can actually reproduce this slide that I had prepared here like about a year and a half or two years ago. So this is like uh, R markdown is basically R with LaTeX inside of it and you run that in R studio and you're gonna reproduce Lots of lots of nice pictures, just like I had in my old slides, for instance, here. Like, for instance, here I simulated some data that was like uh, like piecewise constant. And then the state space model is learning forward that you're actually moving from level four, then level one, and then level like minus one. And then you do the, the backwards moving the same way, and then you show how the things evolve. So this set of slides is like a combination of everything I talked about but for the uh, simple linear regression setup. So uh, go ahead, Alex. Uh, thank you, Edbeth. This is really wonderful because uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, many people like me in the audience are excited about uh, having access to this material. And this is very much in the spirit of this webinar. But I have a question. Uh, is there any relationship between dynamic linear models and ARMA models or RIMA models? And if, yeah. if there is, why do you prefer dynamic linear models to describe the behavior of a time series? Yeah, that's a good question. In fact, if you go to the, the beginning of the Bayesian approach to time series of following state space models, the motivation is to show that if you have a first order, <clears throat> if you have a first order DLM, you are basically mimicking an ARMA 1-1 model. And if you have a second order DLM, you have an ARMA 1-2. So there are some connections between the two. And I think the main, the main difference is the fact that when you, when you think about ARMA models, you are in a more parsimonial setup because you, you translate the whole dynamic of the, of the Y into this, you know, these filters. And then in the state space model, you, you always, uh, you always have uncertainty about the states, no matter how much observations you get. So there's a second level of uncertainty that could be, it's usually a pain in the ass, but it could be beneficial for you who are modeling more complex uh, scenarios. So I, I think that's one of the, the explanation, but I do recommend reading chapter, I don't know, two or three of Weston Harrison, where they talk a lot about the relationships and how, relatively simple state space models with static variances. They, once observations are collected, they converge to ARMA 
uh, AR and ARMA moving average uh, processes. Yes, thanks for thanks for the. So they are related, right? They uh, are related. The, the, and, and actually, dynamic linear models are more general, at least in my view. Uh, I, I, we have a question in the chat. Are the results likely to be different if you use a small sample size or very large sample size? It depends. Uh, if you're if you're talking about learning static parameters, no, because in, if, even if you are talking about this this simple example here, if you're talking about a simple linear, simple state space model. Let me make this bigger. In this one here, the first equation I have beta t and sigma square. The second equation, which is the evolution, I have tau square. So if I'm learning about sigma square and tau square, even if I do have a latent process, which are the beta t's, the time varying parameters, the observations, the, the law of large numbers, central limit theorem is all the asymptotic results will say that after 100, 100 observations, you're going to learn relatively well sigma square and tau square. Yes. So once you learn, you know, a lot about sigma square and tau square, what's going to happen is that you learn what is unknown statically in your system, but the system is still stochastic. That's what makes this equation here, because you're never going to know what's beta t plus one. You only know that's beta t plus beta t plus one will be around beta t with a, a well estimated tau square that was estimated with a hundred observations. But if it was a hundred observations or a thousand observations, the uncertainty about beta t given beta t minus one would still be tau square, no matter how well we estimate tau square. If tau square is like one, it's going to converge to one, but it's always going to be one. So you learn static parameters relatively well, but the states are still like, you know, there. So that's a, that's one of the things about state space models. There is always uncertainty about the states because it's one new state for per observation. Any more questions? Let me see. What behavior should the data poses for us to know that the dynamic model is adequate? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's not like uh, you don't look at the data and say, oh, this, this is better um, estimated by a dynamic model than by a non-dynamic model. Um, model comparison, model checking, and model criticism is part of uh, state space models as it is in any other area of uh, statistics for Bayesians. So when I say I'm going to fit, when I'm going to model the Ys here as a linear model, in this case, linear regression, Gaussian with a static sigma square, and the, 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 the time variant parameter is going to be just a random walk around tau square this is there is like six or seven assumptions here that all should be or must be questioned and you do that by comparing like gaussians and student t non-linear models time varying sigma square time varying tau square there's a bunch of other models so you're, you're still there's no answer okay this is the best model so you have to compare in a class of models or compare to alternative models so like like alex was asking a few minutes ago Oh, what if I get the same problem and then do like an armor structure? So which one will be the best? Well, it depends what you mean by best. It's like out of sample forecast, model fitting, interpretation. So each one of those um, goals will lead to models that might be more or less complicated. Let's see. Let's see if there's there is any. a second question. Yeah. Is there a vector version of the model where the X's and the Y's are vectors instead of? Yes. Uh, Again, if you go back to most of the <clears throat> state space models in uh, uh, Weston Harrison chapter four and beyond, you have not only vectors for, for X's and Y's, but you might have matrices for X and Y. And if you go even further, there is what we call like this arrays. So you could have like this uh, tensors. So you might have like three or four dimensions in X and why, and then you try to model those things dynamically. So I, I don't do that research, but I've seen you know people working on things that are, that are like that, yes. But the most, the most common extension is, for instance, <clears throat> the most common extension is to think about the Y as a vector of macroeconomic variables and the X, all the, the legs of these Ys in a vector autoregression setup. So in this case, you have like, 10 variables and uh, on the on the on the right hand side you have a hundred legs for those 10 variables 
and now you ha you have like a vector <clears throat> of uh, state uh, varying uh, coefficients of the dimension of a thousand. So now you have a thousand in beta and you want to learn about the things. And these days you put like stochastic volatility on the variance of those vector autoregression. And uh, because we're getting to a, a point where the dimension of the y's and or x's or betas are increasing drastically, people started to talk about sparsity inducing priors to make many of these coefficients go to zero, either statically or dynamically. So the research in this area is very vast. And now I'm gonna make some uh, advertisement. You can go to <clears throat> my page and go here on the papers. And if you look at not only not necessarily my papers, but if you if for instance, if you look at these papers that my one of my PhD students have worked in the last few years, they talk, for instance, dynamic portfolio location in high dimension using sparse risk factors. So if you go to the literature there, you see that people are using uh sparse, you know, structures for for that. Like in this other paper, number six, dynamic sparsity on dynamic regression models with uh Paloma Uribe, one of my former uh, PhD students. Uh, you have slides here, you can check. So that's uh, state-based models in the, only in one in a tiny little direction um, of uh, research. So any more questions here? No, I don't think so, right? Because in the no, Q&A, so it's empty now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me, let, so that was uh, in, my, in my setup, that was, the slides, the, the second group of slides. I'm gonna go to, because <clears throat> I only have like half an hour, a little bit less than half an hour. I'm gonna show you like some slides that I prepared some uh, some time ago, but I think that is already here, open somewhere. Let me see. Because I don't wanna, I don't like to open PDFs on the, oh. I think I lost that. Oh, here one. <clears throat> I prefer to not to open the PDFs on the internet because it it, it loses some area. Uh, this is one. There are several. There are several packages. Well, not several, but there are a couple of packages in R that 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 do uh, MCMC for state space models. One of them, which has which was running up to like a few months ago because I tested in one of my courses, <clears throat> is this one that was um, developed by, by Stephen Scott when he was still at Google 10 years ago or so. And the idea is that, and that's the thing like for those who, of you who are starting to think about you know, getting into uh, safe space models. So you don't have to code all these full conditionals, MCMC schemes. You can use this kind of... Um, uh, this kind of uh, um, of packages, or you can use like uh, in the book by um, uh, Prado, West, and uh, Ferreira, they have like the DLM package as well. So there are a couple of packages that do, you know, try to include, incorporate several state-space models, relatively simple state-space models in a package so you can use that. So I'm gonna just show you how <clears throat> a couple of those translate. So if you look at this first one, we have the observation equation. And here I'm saying I have a, a linear trend, yt depends on yt minus one plus some slope. And the slope is also a random walk. So this is a very common, what we call linear trend model. And this is how we would set it up using that package. So add local linear trend because that's a local linear trend. And then you can say, well, let, let me add a seasonal component. So you say add seasonal, and it basically adds a seasonal components for, let's say, if you have monthly data and the, 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 the season is like a whole year, S here will be 12. So you take gamma 1T uh, as a combination of the previous ones, and the gamma S as a trans translation of the S, gamma S T minus 1 at time T minus 1. So you create like a a cycle of of, <clears throat> of period 12 or depending on, on this structure. But the thing is here, you just create that like very easily in, in, uh, in R. And if, but you could also add like a seasonality that is trigonometric, which means like you have like varying, uh, time varying, uh, you know, periods and frequencies for the, the seasonal components. 
So here's one data set that is very famous. Everyone that does time series, whether Bayesian or not, whether state space model, armor model, is this airline data. This airline data is the number of passengers in a particular company over the years. And here is probably in, already transformed to the log or whatever. And uh, you see a clear pattern. So what we do here is say, oh, how about if I model YT as a, <clears throat> a trend, which is a second order trend because of this mu and this the delta, plus gamma 1t, where gamma 1t goes down here with the seasonality. So it's like a, a, a linear trend, like a intercept, a slope plus seasonality. So you see that this model has a bunch of uh, latent states. And uh, you want to learn about all these variances here on the on the right, the observation variance, the level variance, the slope variance, the seasonality variance <clears throat> in the state space model. How would you do that? So you start the package, you get the data, like you can just copy and paste my slide and then run that in R. So install the package, upload the package, get the data, air passengers, call that log of the air passengers. And then you say, add local linear trend to Y. Apparently, Edbert was disconnected. Um, I'm contacting him to double check what's going on. Hi everyone, I'm contacting Eddie back to the boat check what happened. Uh, if, if you joined from the beginning, you know that he was connecting from a hotel because he's attending a conference. Hopefully he will be connected. He will be back with us soon. Actually, I thought that I was the one who got disconnected for a minute. I'm just going to mute myself. I'm going to try and call him. Uh, let's wait for for a few minutes. In the meantime, uh, note that the recording will be available from our website. If you go up in the chat, uh, I'm, I'm going to post, I'm going to copy and paste our website again, the, the CIRS, the, the Committee on International Relations of the American Statistical Association. So if you like, uh, you can download all the material uh, Donna soon will uh, post the link to his website where all the material for this webinar is available. Uh, when he got cut, he was showing uh, how to fit a dynamic linear model for, 
for the airline data using the BSTS package, if I'm not mistaken, by Steve Scott. Uh, but it's already 1.12 uh, in Easter time. I'm I'm busy. I'm now in Rio here. It's 3.12 p.m. For Pritam, it's 1.12 a.m., right, Pritam? And I see that all of you are in different time zones. Uh, if you do me, please, to help us complete the evaluation form that uh, Donna uh, also posted the link in the chat. This helps us uh, reviewing uh, the, the different sessions. And if you do have topics to suggest that you think it would be interesting and would be very much in the spirit of this webinar, uh, please let us know. You can contact any of us. So there he is. He's back. So Eddie, I was telling them that you were in the middle of the airline. I was just reviewing and and uh, asking them to to. I, yeah, I don't know what I don't know what happened. I re I think I realized like a few five minutes later that no one was <laughs> with me here. So I I'm gonna go back to this example. Okay, great. Let me go back here. Uh, I think I was doing that. I was doing that. Yeah. Outside, I was doing it here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I apologize for that. So I think it is a nice example because it shows that if you, for instance, if you use a seasonality that is just a dummy for each month of the year and you put embed that into a state-based model, mm -hmm. uh, you get a, a trend, which is this weekly, you know, moving up. But the seasonality is basically saying every single year seasonality is the same. You know, when you look at the data, uh, it's, it's clear that at the beginning, the seasonality doesn't behave exactly as it is here in the, at the end. If you look at the last one, two, three, four, five years, it looks a lot more like each other than the first couple of years. So when you do models, state space models with, um, with this trigonometric seasonality that allows the, the seasonality also to vary over time more, more slowly, but still vary over time, then you see that the trend becomes almost a line. So it, it, as someone asked a question, uh, how do I know if a model is good or not? In this case, I would simply say, drop the linear trend of this state space model, just get rid of like a deterministic line that devolves over time, because that's basically what this is, and just model that residual with a trigonometric seasonal component. So that's like being pragmatic about making your model a little bit less uh, uh, complex because part of the complexity disappears when you actually incorporate uh, a seasonality that is more 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 general. So what I was about to say when my internet here uh, vanished was that uh, I wanted to spend and now I guess not twenty but the next ten minutes or so. Uh, if you are you guys still here? <laughs> Yes. Okay. I, I will. I will keep my camera open such that you know. Okay, I'm gonna keep this co little corner here so I know that you're not frozen. <laughs> not frozen from the movie, but frozen, Alex. Yeah, please. <laughs> one example that I've been working forever. One kind of problem that I've been working forever with day space models is modeling uh, variances over time. And there's like a whole literature on variances that follow the ARMA type behavior, like the arch garch type models. But there's also this other class of state space model people that do a state space model, look at that problem and say, well, you could do, you know, like a state space model for the variance as well. So I'm going to motivate quickly with this data, the S&P 500, which is an international data everyone knows is the, is like a, an index in the US stock market that is based on 500 companies. So it's very, uh, informative about you know the, the the behavior of the economy or the the market in the U.S. So here I had like this data, and as you can see, I have uh, in as in the previous um, set of notes, I have these slides, so you can just go and and download the data and get everything. So here I have like the S and P 500 over the years, for in this case for only like five or six years, we have like 1,200 observations. And you see it here we have probably the, the COVID period. I remember that I didn't get COVID at the time, but I lost all my money, but eventually got back here, my health. <laughs> and now this ends in March, May 
2022, there was like a crisis again and it go back up. So one thing would be nice to update this, this example with data up, up to here. But people don't care about the necessarily about the price because it's almost a random walk. What we do is we try to model the, the returns. In this case, log returns. So log returns has this pattern of over time, it looks like it's small variance for a long period and then like an avalanche of big variances up and down, like big returns, small returns. And that's when you look at the, when you look at this picture on the left, smashing it on this Y ax, this is the histogram we get. So if you get everything together, it looks like it's not Gaussian, but that's because you're not taking into account the time behavior. So the first model would, see, would be like, okay, how about if I just think about this as IID? It's not gonna work. It doesn't look IID, you know, as you can see here. And then we model as a student T and we learn about the, the degree of freedom. So nothing, nothing um, state space uh, oriented yet. You know, just like talking about, you know, learning about the stochasticity of this data. And here's the histogram and you see that the blue one, which is, I don't know, let's see, the blue one here is um, uh, a student T with uh, the new hat that comes from this search here, which is probably true. So a student T with two degrees of freedom fits that data better than the Gaussian. So the Gaussian is the red one, pretty bad. The student T with two degrees of freedom, almost like a Cauchy distribution takes all the tail. That's great because, you know, you're getting better than just looking at the Gaussian um, the variation of the model, but it's, there's still no, no, uh, no information about time varying variances uh, in this case. And that's where we enter with this model. I'm gonna make this bigger because this, the, the, the font here is really bad. So let me make that bigger, where's that? Okay, right here. So in this case, Look, uh, I, I, it's still very bad. I think it is, you, you guys can see what this uh, expression relatively well now, right? Yes. What we're basically saying is that you model log returns, which is the YT. When I say that there is like a constant here or something in front of Gaussian zero one errors, that's basically saying this is the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is modeled as an, an exponential of HT. So HT is the log of the variance. So we do that notation because we want to model the log of the variance because we don't like to model positive numbers. We like to model real numbers. So the log of the variance is an AR1 process, the way it's written here. Not only that, but we can allow for the error in the observation equation to be related to the error in the evolution equation. That's something new from the examples that I just showed you. Now we have a correlation between the two, the two types of error. In economics, that means that you might have like you know, might have like mean reversion in terms of like high returns going back to low returns in terms of uh, um, finance data. So the question is sometimes you want to model this row and see if it's zero or not. That, uh, well, that's like a fee, but it's like a, 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 a different fee. If that persistent parameter is close to one or not, meaning you have a long memory for the stochastic volatility for the variance, and you have what we call the variance of the variance, which is this sigma. So there are three, st there are four static parameters, like someone asked a question. After a lot of observations, we're gonna learn well mu, phi, sigma, and rho. But the state um, HT will be a new one and then I'm gonna use that for forecasting and other things. So the four models, we call this stochastic volatility model. So there is SV, which is the Gaussian version of what we have here on the top with rho equals zero. And then we have the SV student T where these errors are student T and rho is equal to zero. And then SVL and SVTL is the same, but now with the leverage, which is this row known zero. So it, you can fit each one of those models. That's what I ba I'm basically listing down here, okay? And why, do, why am I doing this? Just to illustrate that if you go to this one particular R package, stock vol, it's basically fitting specifically this class of model with all these types of uh, interactions. It's different from the BSTS package that I just presented because that's a little bit more general, but it's for essentially for linear, or they, they do tackle Gaussian beta student T errors, 
but this is specifically for stochastic volatility. And one thing about Bayesian inference in specific models is that <clears throat> if you're thinking about specific model, you can also think about more efficient MCMC schemes. So there is a trade-off here. So if you do want to work on this, then you use the algorithms and packages that are more efficient. Or if you don't, if you're just going to do like an exercise that you have to do between now and January, go and use Stan, you know, just get one of those win bugs type of generic uh, probabilistic programming uh, languages and then just shove it there, your prior, your model, and then it's going to take like 10 hours. It's going to spit out some result and you say, oh, I like this. I think I'm in the right direction. And then you go spend six months coding that <laughs> because then you want to do it fast and uh, efficiently, but you know you're, you, you're going to get results. So it's like a, a laboratory. So you have to pick what you, you need. But right now I'm talking about this stochastic volatility model, which is a state space model. The state variable is the log volatility, HT. And uh, we want to learn about this HT for different types of structures of epsilon T and, and U. And, and in this case, I'm just going to use the priors that they talk about in the in the package. I could spend half an hour explaining why this priors would be interesting. I don't like just say, oh, use a, a vague prior. It's not what I'm saying here. Just I don't have time for that. So here are the references. And I'm going to show you how easy it is. So we have the returns, which are up here somewhere, because I have code for those returns somewhere. <laughs> but now, instead of using a random, uh, a, a Gaussian distribution or a student T distribution, I'm going to say, do a stochastic volatility model for returns where the name here says everything. SV sample or SV, the SV sample, SV Gaussian with independent errors. Here's student T errors, still independent. Here is Gaussian errors, but with a correlation. And here's the student T errors with that correlation, the L, the leverages for that. So these four names is basically sending to different little boxes that will just run the, MCM, the, the, the MCMC scheme for each one of those cases. And I run this for a thousand draws after burning of a of hundred, just like a small exercise. And I collect all the output from this feed. And I do a bunch of plots, which are basically this I look I can look at for instance the persistent the persistent this persistence parameter for each one of those models that out, auto regressive coefficient and you see here for instance that the the black and red which are the Gaussian no the black and red which are the independent make the persistent higher but when I allow for the leverage effect the persistence decreases a little bit. So then you can spend like five pages in a journal of finance to explain that. But here's just like feeding all these models. And of course, some of the models have parameters that others don't. For instance, row only appears in a couple of models and uh, student T also only appear in a couple of models. Uh, basically saying, well, you see like, th th of course I probably need like more than a thousand draws here. This was, uh, was just lazy to, to make that example. But when I look at the log volatilities, even though the parameters are all different with all this variability, but the variability is not that big. When I look at the point estimate of the volatilities, they are not very different. So you're estimating the state processes relatively well, you know, here in the log scale, but I don't understand log volatilities. What I do understand is standard deviation of the actual time series. Then you go back and you get the standard deviation. So you see that the standard deviation go from zero to 0 0.07, but most of the time are less than half of 0 0.01. And, uh, and here, of course, there are moments where it's much higher than the other ones. That's relative to the static models that I, I, I printed at the beginning. Uh, and here I just separate them to show like how these models uh, relate. You see that on the top one, we don't have this, um, leverage effect, this correlation between the errors of the two equations. <coughs> you see that by allowing that, this, um, this smooth recovery becomes more erratic. So there's another you know, argument about which one is the right one. There's nothing here that says there is a right one. There are four representations of modeling variances in a state space model. You have to pick your metric to compare them how this perform in the future, how you create portfolio allocation based on this, 
Yeah, if you do simulated data, that's another thing. You could do like out of sample mean square error, but usually that's not what we we tend to do. Let's see. Oh, here I just pick like a stretch of the data just to see how they differ. Because I mean, it's not easy to see what's going on between like zero and 1200 observations. But when I look at only 300 observations, you see that they are more or less smooth, depending on what you what you want to do. Okay. So um, I know it's it's kind of crazy because I went, uh, what did I say now? Let me do that. Uh, I went way too fast, but if we go here to where I mentioned on the page, uh, what I was trying to do is basically, you know, I gave you like a, a brief overview of state space models, linear and Gaussian. You have um, R code and R results on two and four. And three is basically one one of the various packages you could do based on state space modeling that is available in uh, on the internet. Uh, if you look at if you visit Alex page, you're gonna see a bunch of state space models in in applications in spatial uh, in spatial uh, space time uh, structures. If you look at my own papers, you're gonna see like that in many places as well. For instance. Stochastic volatility models with uh, skewness selection. That's something that one of my PhD students is doing right now. Um, let's see another one here quickly. Uh, uh, Edbeth, we have a question, which I think yes. is a very interesting one because I hear this all the time. In some of the shown examples, there might be overfitting issue. DLMs involve several parameters which might, might be eventually overfitting the data. How to tackle the, this issue with DLM if this is the case? Yeah, well, good question because the point is, what is what is um, the purpose of of uh, feeding or learning uh, a structure using state space models? If you are doing like forecasting, then it's easy to 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 talk about overfitting because you can always like see how these uh, models extrapolate out of the sample or extrapolate out of a particular square in terms of uh, interpolation and stuff like that, and you can say, look. Even though within the sample I fit very well, but out of sample I, I screw up. So that's a way to control for overfitting. But some other time, what you're trying to do is to <clears throat> not learn about how this model fits well into the future, but how it explains some pattern that you might expect. For instance, you know moments where there there were crises in the economy or you know climate changes. Are you have like particular patterns, and you can see if these models capture that within the data. So. It depends. Sometimes you actually do want to overfit because you want to emphasize those regions of the data that has some particular component. So overfitting is, is something that is worrying if you're trying to do the same modeling for a new data. Because then you, when you do overfitting, what you're basically saying is that you're going to fit this data really well, but you're going to fit this other data relatively bad. So you have to split the data somehow. Mm -hmm. Or... You, you but in terms of the number of... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say, like, uh, other ways of beforehand trying to take care of that is to make your priors or the structure that you put in the system more uh, penalizing these kinds of going in one direction without paying a price. So you overfitting usually happens because you say, well, if I keep including variables, it's always going to get better, but you have to penalize somehow. And priors are natural penalizers. But if you use a prior that is not clever, you're not going to penalize. So either you do uh, out of sample comparisons, or you make your prior more like uh, more strict, like penalizing overfitting in the sense that well, if two mod like I show the the airline data in the airline data, the model where the 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 trend component was extremely like close to a line. Could be easily replaced by a line so that's what i'm saying but also i really like your uh, first slides where you show the effective number of parameters that you have in a dlm that basically you have the one the initial information and the variances because uh, because of the the evolution equation you can rewrite everything in terms just of these parameters so sometimes i feel that people misunderstand this that although you have all these uh these state parameters effectively when you substitute the the, rec the the evolution equation it boils down to fewer parameters yes that's that? a good point it, 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 usually like 
just to finalize historically, we think about parameters because like, back then, like 100 years ago, parameters were actually like, you count one, two, three, four, five. But every time you go from an equation of observables, conditional observables and parameters, and then you, you go and fence yourself, including another level, then you're done because the next level, when you shrink parameters towards one another, the notion of the number of parameters disappears because the, the amount of shrinkage will say that you, 100 parameters become two in, in a way, or three. So how do mm -hmm. you count that? So then you don't count parameters. You you count what we call effective number of parameters or something that resembles that. Yeah. But that's a, that's a good point. And I think okay. we need to go and read the, the DIC, the deviance information criteria. These guys, they do take care of that in some cases. Uh Timothy has another question. Can you integrate the LM with spatial temporal models and how? Just to remind you that we are already at half of the hour, so yeah. just for the sake of time. Um, integrate, not in the sense of integration of Monte Carlo errors, right? You mean like combining yeah. the LM? Can with you the incorporate? The, I mean, just go to Alex's website and you're going to find like a 10 papers on that. I have a couple here as well that I wrote like with Aster, and 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 Danny millions of years ago, where we do like a, a spatial temporal factor model, which is just combining everything. But yes, this is something that exists. There, I think in the book by um, what is that famous book that Alan wrote with uh, spatial uh, temporal uh, spatial energy like with uh, it's energy uh, Carling and Gelfand on yeah. spatial temporal models. Yeah, they yeah. do have a chapter on uh, how to incorporate uh, spatial structure into dynamic linear models. Yeah. And the other book by Cressy and Wico, the Wico, whatever, they do have that as well. Like they have another book completely on that. So I think yeah. the literature is vast in that. So you, Indeed. If, if you don't find, just email me. My email is my first name, Hedbert at gmail.com. Great. So for, it's already 35. I think we will end here. I'd like to thank everyone who showed up, uh, but especially Edibet, uh for a very interesting webinar. I love this topic. And uh, as usual, whenever I see him talking, I, I learn something new, although it's a topic <laughs> that I know for quite a while. Uh, so thank, thanks everyone, and uh, hopefully we will hopefully no, we will be back next year, probably in the beginning of March, and uh, stay tuned for for the new uh, sessions on this webinar that is uh, organized by SEERS, the the Committee on International Relations of the American Statistical Association and Statistics Without Border. I would like to thank again Donna Lalonde, who has been a, a key component of the organization of this webinar because this whole structure, the Zoom link, everything is uh, organized by the ASA. So consider becoming a member. We need to strengthen our community. Uh, with this, uh, I end here and I wish you all happy holidays. Take care. Hope to see you in 2024. Thank you guys. Take care. Have a good night, <laughs> good morning, good afternoon. Yeah, exactly. Good afternoon, wherever you are, exactly. Thank you, everyone.